presentation is not as great as I hoped for, because when I promised Radek to give the talk like a year ago, <laughs> I expected this time of the year to be very calm and plenty of time for preparations. But actually, it's the most busiest time in many years, because as you know, sometimes it happens that you have to finalize the financing and so on, and the negotiations are going just right now on. <laughs> so I was really briefly getting together some past presentations, but I think still we can have some discussions and uh, about this NADPH imaging. So the thing is uh, that in, uh, as Alex said, in 2015, we started the new facility at Biocef and uh, the new facility is uh, offering multiple services. It's open access and it offers uh, light microscopy, electron microscopy, flow cytometry and data analysis. And as such, we started to be active in the field and offer various services. And in 2016, I think we organized a film workshop together with Beck and Hickel. And at that uh, workshop, oh, sorry, this is the Biocef, this is in the middle of the field. <laughs> but uh, in that workshop, uh, there was invited uh, Thomas Becker from England, and he introduced the NADPH imaging. And that inspired us uh, to offer this service to our users. And as we had two photon system based on uh, Carl size LSM 880, so we could straightforwardly go for this methodology and offer it to our users. So, but first let's have a look uh, at the NADPH and why it's important. So NADPH is a coenzyme that is uh, very important in many aspects of cellular energy metabolism. As you can see on the screen, uh, let me have the pointer. Uh, so NADH and NADPH are appearing in many, many reactions that are influencing the metabolism of the cell. They are in the glycolysis, they are in the oxidative phosphorylation, they are appearing in the synthesis of different nucleotides, and basically it plays a cru crucial role. And as such, it's a good target for cell biologists <clears throat> to follow how the cells are behaving, what is their metabolism. The thing is that the NADH and NADPH are not present uh, at the same concentrations in different uh, comp compartments of the cell. So you can see the example that when you have, for example, a, a mitochondria with its matrix, so that the NADH and NADPH are present inside and outside. As, as a general, the NADH and NADPH are mostly present in mitochondria, where they are <clears throat> taking part in the oxidative uh, phosphorylation and as such uh, offers an opportunity for the scientists to follow their concentrations and their state. Uh, why NADH and NADPH are so important for imaging and cell metabolism? The key aspect is, so when you look at the structure of the NADH or NADPH, <clears throat> so it has an oxidized and reduced state. Uh, the, in the oxidized states, the fluorescent is not fluorescent. The molecule does not have fluorescence. But in the reduced state, you can see here, there's a <clears throat> moiety that is responsible for uh, fluorescence. And this moiety can fluoresce. The difference between NADH and NADPH is the phosphor moiety, which is placed on the other side of the molecule, and as such does not influence at all the fluorescence properties of the molecule. So basically NADH and NADPH are basically spectrally indistinguishable from each other when looking in the cells. So let's look at the spectra. So uh, when you want to image cells, you often have an issue with the autofluorescence, especially in the blue and green spectral region. The most, uh, the, the common sources of the autofluorescence are, is the tryptophan, which has the excitation in the UV range and the emission in the uh, still UV or short blue range. And NADH can be excited in the UV, but also almost close to the visible range and emits in the region from 400 to 550 nanometers. So here it overlaps with the blue and green fluorescence. And another coenzyme that is uh, fluorescently active is FAD that is being uh, excited even with 488. For example, when you look at the spectra and emits from 500 to 600. So basically it overlaps with GFP. So the NADH and FAD are the most common sources of autofluorescence that you can have in your images. So for example, if your GFP is only uh, 
mildly expressed. Now, probably you can be imaging the FAD signal instead of GFP because 488 will excite FAD <laughs> and it will emit in the same range. There's also some things to pay attention to, but this disadvantage for specific imaging can be turned into an advantage when you look into the metabolism. So the thing is that if you don't label the cells, so you can still follow the signal from these molecules. The thing is <clears throat> that uh, to excite NADH, one would have to go to the UV. And as you probably know, UV light is not very well accepted by cells. It causes a lot of phototoxicity. So there, therefore, uh, instead of using uh, one photon excitation to excite the NADH in the UV range, people turn into using two photon uh, excitation process uh, where you can use the double wavelength with half energy of each photon to excite the fluorescence uh, with a similar impact on the excitation properties of the fluorophore. So in, when you look here at 350, 370, you can still excite. If you double this wavelength, you get into 740 nanometers. And NADH has a peak of absorption for two photon excitation at 740 nanometers. So the advantage is that uh, when you use two photon excitation to see the NADH, you excite the molecules only in the focal spot of uh, the laser, of the uh, focused laser, not along the whole path. So that means the two photon excitation is causing much less phototoxicity to the cells and it allows uh, for long-term imaging of the cells which are quite ha uh, happily alive through the, throughout the acquisition. So for me, this is one key point that the NADH imaging is made feasible and can reach some really trustworthy results. Uh, the, there are multiple motivations to image the NAD and ADPH depending on the research topic of the groups. And, uh, you know, I don't want to go into the, all the details. You can find it in literature, <laughs> you know, but uh, this is really uh, a part of different, multi, uh, of different metabolic paths. And uh, the, not only that, because uh, the second motivation is that there are a lot of studies. So these data are two years old. So together, I guess today, it will be around 2000 person lifetime imaging studies of NADH and ADPH. And uh, people basically often observe changes. So when something happens to the cells, like apoptosis, necrotic deterioration, and so on, the metabolism is changing. And often the change in the metabolism is an off, uh, has an offset before other visible changes in the uh, cell physiology. So basically first the metabolism starts to change and only then you can see that the cells are changing the shape, uh, are dying, are picking up being apoptotic and so on. So often uh, there's a hope that the NADH and NADPH imaging can be also used in the medical research to uh, in the clinics. Uh, so, uh, uh, the question is how to resolve the NADH and NADPH in the cells and what does it mean if you look at the signal? So the thing is that if you only get some signal, what does that mean? Uh, in the work of Thomas Blecker, uh, so he showed that when you look at the uh, fluorescence lifetime of NADH, that means that you use two photon, uh, that you used uh, 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 single photon counting uh, device to get the lifetimes. So I didn't put it here, <laughs> but basically it means that if the two photon laser is Titan Sapphire laser usually is a pulse laser. So you know exactly when the fluorescence of NADH is excited, and then you have a single photon counting detector. And this single photon counting detector tells you exactly at what time the photon was detected. And basically by subtracting the time of detection and the time of excitation, you get the time, how the, mole, uh, the time that the molecule spent in the excited state lifetime. And you do this for thousands or tens of thousands repetitions, and you collect a so-called histogram, which tells you for how long the molecule was excited before it emitted the photon. And the trick is that the lifetime depends on the on the environment and the physical presence of the molecule. And, and for NADPH, uh, it was shown that if the NADPH is present in a, uh, in, a, in a solution, 
they basically it's not bound to any protein or enzyme. It has a very short lifetime of three to 400 nanosecond. But as soon as the NADH and NADPH is a, is a part of some complex, basically it's uh, uh, in its surrounding there are a lot of uh, proteins. These proteins are protecting this NAD and NADPH molecule from the water. And this extends the lifetime because the water is quenching the lifetime. So once the water is, uh, water is removed, the lifetime gets longer. So basically the key uh, observation is that uh, when you have the excited state decay from the NADPH, the short component, which is marked here at the beginning, corresponds to the amount of free uh, NAD or NADPH and the amount of the, uh, the amplitude of the long lifetime corresponds to the number of molecules, or basically the amount of molecules that are bound to the proteins. So basically this allows you to change between the short, the amplitude of the short lifetime and the amplitude of the long lifetime, directly tells you how many of the molecule is free and how many of the molecule is bound. Of course, and this means that this reflects the metabolism of the NADH in the cells. Uh, another important aspect for the NADH and NADPH imaging is, that uh, people would like to re uh, resolve between this phosphorylated and non-phosphorylated uh, form. And based on the work of Thomas Blecker, they kind of uh, go into conclusion that as the NADPH is a part of different metabolic paths and during the reactions, the NADPH is much more tightly bound to the proteins, the lifetime of the bound NADPH form is much, much longer than the form of the, uh, then the bound NADH form. And then came with a formula that allows you to estimate the ratio between the bound NADH and the bound NADPH. That means we can get the ratio of the free forms and the bound forms. And in the, uh, from the bound forms, we can distinguish how much is the NADH and NADPH. And the reason is that each of these coenzymes uh, takes part in different, different metabolic paths. Uh, here's an example from the literature from the Thomas Blecker. Uh, they studied different cells types. And, but here, what I want to uh, bring your attention to is that basically here on the top, you can see the signals. But uh, the thing is that you cannot take the signal from the whole image because you have a lot of background. The signal from nucleus is often lower. You have some bright spots and weak spots. So the common approach is to uh, use uh, uh, image segmentation, as you see, to select the signal from nucleus, to select the signals from mitochondria, and to select the sig signal from the cytosol. And then you can follow the changes in the metabolism in different parts of the cells. I don't want to go uh, in details through this part. I just wanted to highlight that the segmentation and the, uh, followed by the film analysis is the key to get some meaningful data. Uh, in our facility, the first user, uh, Jan Blecha of NADH and APH, is uh, from the group of uh, Jakub Rohlena and Jiří Neužil. They wanted to see uh, a different cells which were proliferating which, or which were quiescent, and they wanted to follow the metabolism. Basically, this was not the only method they had. They had multiple approaches how to study this, and this was one of the tool set to follow that. And firstly, they just were interested in the overall intensity from NADH or NADPH. And when they look at the, the, dif the differences between the proliferating quiescent cells, they could clearly see there is much more signal in the quiescent cells. That means there is much more of the reduced form of the NADH or NADPH. But the increase of signal does not have to mean there is a more of the bound of the, there is a more of the reduced state. It just can simply mean that the ratio between the bound and free has changed. Because if the NADH is free, the lifetime is short, intensity is low. Once it binds to the coenzymes to other proteins, the lifetime gets longer and longer lifetime means high intensity. So just following the overall intensity does not tell you if you have more of the reduced form or if you have more bound form than free form. So basically intensity alone cannot answer you fully the question what was happening on. So that's why we offer them, let's do the flim. You don't follow just the intensity, just look at the uh, lifetime patterns. 
And here you can see some typical images from uh, uh, the experiments. So the idea is uh, that they have some uh, parental cells and they have row zero cells, which have uh, destroyed the mitochondrial DNA. And therefore these cells don't show the oxidative phosphorylation because they are missing some enzymes. So they are surviving thanks to the glycolysis. They don't have the oxidative phosphorylation. And the, uh, when you look at the images, the shorter the lifetime, the more blue the images are. The longer lifetime means the red color. So in other words, the lifetime is color, the, the lifetime is, uh, is color coded. And clearly uh, by, by looking at the images, you can still see the differences. But it's not, uh, although seeing is, be, uh, is believing, I think it's better to quantify. So for purpose of the pu publication, we average the excited state lifetimes over multiple samples. And there you can see some significant difference in this uh, longer lifetime change. So the ratio between the short and long lifetime has changed for these molecules. Or you can use so-called phaser plot. So instead of fitting the data, you just display them in the Fourier transform plot. And this approach just takes the whole decay and multiplies it by sine and cosine functions. And so this is the uh, cosine, this is the sine function and gives you the position of the data on the, on the plot. Each square on this plot corresponds to one image. And it's clearly uh, visible that the resolution of the method is, uh, is, uh, is high enough to clearly demonstrate that the native cells have completely different metabolism than the row zero cells, so those which have knocked the DNA mitochondrial. But then after the treatment of the rotenone, which completely influences the metabolism of the cells, they basically are turned into the same state. You know? So this is uh, important to note that often the fitting and so on is not really necessary. The phase plot is a simple and useful approach to see differences between different uh, populations. Uh, the, uh, in the literature, uh, you can often find that people are following not only an ADH or an ADPH signal, but also they are looking at FAD signals and they are making so-called intensity-based FAD and ADPH redox ratio. I will not go into details, I just want to mention it that it's uh, that in case you want to get even deeper uh, inside in what is happening with the metabolism of the cells to follow the FAD, which means to excite with the longer wavelength and detect uh, from 500 to 600, you can also get information about the FAD. Uh, further all, even some people are using the tryptophan, so they are exciting with the free photon excitation and then they can also follow the lifetime of the tryptophan. So the, for the complete, uh, in the, basically the maximum metabolic imaging that you can almost get, you can use free detector flame acquisition, that you use free photon excitation of tryptophan, two photon excitation of NADH, two photon excitation of AD, and then you combine these signals to get the proper fingerprint. Uh, uh, so, uh, Beck, I would like to also in this last paper, I would like to show the importance of the image segmentation. So these are the data that were presented in the paper and uh, they were showing, so in case they take the whole signal, the differences between the fingerprints are not so significant. Once they are really segmenting it, they can get clear differences between the mitochondria and the, and the other signals. So uh, in our facility, another project that uh, we performed is uh, to follow the metabolism of sperms. There are multiple groups that study the fertilization process and they often see they want, what they want to match is the status of the sperms with uh, the metabolism. The idea was to follow the metabolism of the sperm and to find out if these sperms are really, uh, they, they can uh, are fertile, whether they are really working. 
of no. So basically, they wanted to make the uh, link between the metabolic fingerprint of the sperm and its uh, medical function in the real organism. And the tr tricky thing was that to image the cells, uh, to image the sperms is not easy because they are motile. And if you want to immobilize them on a cover slip, uh, they often change the metabolism. So basically different treatments, different sample preparation resulted in different uh, fingerprints, different behavior of the sperms. So at the end, uh, the user Fitore Kusari decided to measure the sperms directly in the tissue. So basically this is a mouse. This is the image of the mouse tissue. They dissected uh, the tissue and uh, displayed the sperms directly inside the intestines. But of course, when you look at this image, <laughs> it contains a lot of background. It contains a lot of, uh, a lot of fuzzy signal. So it was not easy to then to get some reasonable information. And the idea was to get the excited state lifetime, the TCSP histogram for every single cell for its uh, mid piece and from its, for its tail, uh, for its head. But uh, so Fitore started with a manual segmentation. But of course, it was taking an enormous amount of time because she had a lot of samples, a lot of images. So it would take years for her to finish the segmentation and to get some significant uh, input on the changes in the cell metabolism. So then uh, in our facility, we offered to use the artificial intelligence and use the manual segmentation to learn the network to identify the sperms. And as you can see, despite the uh, heads are almost barely visible, still, the manual, uh, the manual annotation can show them. And then the neural network prediction is pretty successful that it can recover most of the heads and most of the tails and can identify their positions. So once uh, this uh, neural network was learned, it was applied on the images and the masks were obtained. The marks were returned into the film software. And here again, you can see the phaser plot. So here is the cosine, this is the sine, and each dot uh, is one sperm. <laughs> uh, the green is sperm heads, uh, the, the yellow, uh, the orange is the sperm uh, tails. And basically we were comparing the distributions for the manual segmentation and for the AI-based segmentation. And basically it turned out that uh, the machine learning approach did a really good job. Okay, so this was uh, in very briefly uh, through the principles and some basic insights into an ADH and ADPH imaging. And I will go through still uh, the talk of uh, the group of Virginia Ogil because they were successfully applying this NADH imaging in their research. Uh, they focus on molecular therapy of cancer. And cancer is often related to the changes in the metabolism. So that's why they are interested in NADH or imaging. Uh, so they may, one of the objectives is, is to analyze and understand the molecular biology and the resistance of cancer stem cells towards apoptosis. Uh, so these are the cartoon that are showing what is happening in the, in the cells. That mitochondria is the uh, fuel uh, is the power plant of the cell. It generates, it uh, provides ATP, but not only ATP, it also provides a lot of metabolites. It uh, produces reactive oxygen species. It's uh, important for regulation of calcium and the regulation of a cell death. So it's not only producing energy, it has also other metabolic activities. Uh, I will not uh, bother you with the details of this, but basically in the oxidative phosphorylation cycle, you have a lot of different membrane proteins that take important part in the cell cycle. And the DNA uh, that is coding the synthesis of these transmembrane proteins is in mitochondria. So it's the uh, contained in the mitochondria DNA. Once you knock down the mitochondria DNA, these proteins cannot be synthesized and oxidative phosphorylation is stopped. And these are so-called raw zero cells. So they cannot have any respiration. And uh, there was an idea that uh, if you knock out the, DNA, the mitochondria in the cancer cells, 
that you might kill the cancer and by this uh, you can uh, treat the cancer basically. But uh, they did experiments in mouse, but they were really surprised that if you insert the, health, the healthy cancer cells, let's say, the tumor started to grow up to 10, 12 days. When they destroyed the mitochondria, there was a delay in the, in the growth of the tumor, but at the, at the end, the tumor started to grow again. And they were surprised. So they clearly, the lack of mitochondrial DNA has an effect of the cancer growth, but at the end, it started to grow again. So, and they discovered that this was for the fact that the, that the cells, the cancer cells were stealing the mitochondria from the host. So basically, they were lacking their own mitochondria, but they have stolen the mitochondria from the stroma. And by that, they recovered their function and they could grow again. So they restored the oxidative phosphorylation and this led to the cancer. Uh, in, uh, there were trials in the mouse that in the flow cytometry, they following different populations. They could follow how the mitochondria are being transferred into the cell. And uh, uh, the questions were, uh, how do mitochondria get into the uh, cancer cells that were depleted of DNA? What happens then? And why is the oxidative phosphorylation needed for tumor growth? And this is where the NADPH imaging uh, was used for. So first of all, some images uh, from our CLEM. So here are the cells in the BIC. Here you can see a so-called um, so nanotube that is connecting two different cell types. This is the nanotube. Inside the nanotube, you can see fluorescent labeled mitochondria. So basically the live cell imaging was showing that the cells are able to exchange the mitochondria through these tunneling nanotubes. And then we also applied uh, uh, fluorescent uh, focus ion beam imaging, so-called volume EM, and we were visualizing the content of the nanotube. So basically, we located the nanotubes in the system. Then we put it on the electron microscope, and then we were looking at what is inside. And indeed, we could see a mitochondria present in this nanotube. You know, so that is a cell. There's the, the another cell and you can see the red label mitochondria traveling through these nanotubes into the cancer cell that was lacking the mitochondria previously. So this we showed by standard imaging. And uh, then the question was how it behaves and why does it, uh, how does it influences the cancer metabolism? So these are the designs of the experiments. So they are for cells, then the mitochondria transfer, then the mitochondrial DNA is reconstituted, and then the ox uh, oxidative phosphorylation starts again. So this is uh, published in the paper of Bajzikova. So they were studying at what time scale are these processes happening. And really, I don't want to go into details of this, but it was important for them to follow the NADH and ADPH. So this, uh, uh, this slide you saw already before. So they were the control cells, they were the rotonon cells, they were imaging the lifetimes, and they're following uh, how the activity of the cell was happening in different days after the treatments. And they saw there was an increase in the metabolism in day five, uh, day 15, and that was again decreased back. So that was meaning that first uh, the NADH, the mitochondria was the oxidative phosphorylation was not working properly. So that's why the reduced state of the NADH increased, but then after 20 days, it returned back into the original state. Uh, moreover, we also used the super resolution microscopy to be able to follow the, uh, the mitochondrial DNA in uh, the standard cells. When you look at the confocal images and then in the super resolution static images, you can see that the green is labeling the mitochondrial DNA. The red is the uh, labeling the mitochondria. So you can see that really for these cells, standard cells, the mitochondrial DNA is inside. Whereas if you look at the row zero cells, the, mitochond uh, the mitochondrial DNA signal is not present. So there is nothing inside of the mitochondria. So this was just how super resolution helped to prove that really the difference between the row zero cells and the standard cells is the presence or lack of the mitochondrial DNA. 
And uh, the conclusion of that study was that uh, the cells, the cancer cells, were not growing. The, the tumor didn't grow, not because of lack of energy, but because they were lacking uh, pyrimidines. Yeah, so as, as we said, uh, mitochondria are not only producing ATP, they are also producing uh, different molecules and the production of pyrimine, pyrimine, pyrimides was the fact that the cancer cells could not grow. You know, so it's not because the, of the lack of the ATP, it's because of the lack of pyrimidines. Uh, okay, and uh, uh, so the effect that if you interfere with the oxidative phosphorylation in cells, the fact that the cells do not grow is not thanks to the lack of ATP, but it's to the lack of the biosynthesis of pyrimidine. You know, and of course, this uh, uh, was a very brief uh, showing of the collaboration between Biology Oriented Research Lab and Imaging Core Facility that uh, not only NAD and APH imaging, but also super resolution or CLAM experiments were used to dissect what is happening in this uh, quite interesting uh, feature, how the cancer cells are stealing mitochondria from the uh, host cell and by this they recover their function. Okay, so, and by this, uh, I would like to thank especially the, the people from the Institute of Biotechnology, Jakub Rohena and Romina Kuhářová, that were heavily interested and involved in the NADPH imaging, in the CLAM experiments, in the super resolution. And of course, for the people from the facility, also Radek was to include it. <laughs> and the thing is that uh, by this, I will talk my, uh, finish my talk because I apologize. The thing is that uh, there is a meeting that already started some time ago that was called by the Dean of the faculty. <laughs> And so I have to join that uh, meeting very soon. So thank you. And maybe time for a couple of questions. Thank you very much, Alesh. And yes, please ask questions so that we uh, don't delay Alesh too much from his meeting with the Dean. Thank you, Alex, for the interesting talk. I'm Sudha here. Actually, yes. I just want to know how the metabolic activity means the signal, it interferes with the fluorescent overexpress protein or anything there, or it's only autofluorescence you can work on with the metabolic studies. Uh, so, sorry, I, I had a bit signal. So the question was that how the, the interference of the overexpress protein on the autofluorescence signal in the metabolic studies. Okay, so it means if you have some GFPs or whatever, how that yeah. uh, means how you can... Yeah. Okay, yeah, so uh, the NADH uh, is, I think, rather safe. So you, ca you cannot use the blue or cyan fluorescent protein because they would emit in the same spectral range and be excited, but the GFP is pretty safe. I didn't mention that the signal you collect is usually through a bandpass filter 460 slash 40. That means like from 440 to 480 nanometers. So this is the range which is safe for imaging GFP in the longer regions. You know, so blue, blue and uh, cyan fluorescent proteins probably would interfere. Of course, you cannot use DAPI at all because DAPI would completely overhelm the signal. But uh, from GFPs and longer fluorescence proteins, I think uh, would be safe to image simultaneously, but only for the NAD and ADPH. As soon as you would like to follow the FAD signal as well, which I mentioned is an option, then the GFP is forbidden and you would have to go to MCHARI and longer fluorescence proteins. So it's possible, but not use the really short ones. <laughs> yeah, that's sort of a question, yeah. Yeah, I often okay. work with metabolic studies, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, and actually, overall, I always would recommend, you know, it's not good to have the, uh, like, say, correlative studies that you not only follow one signal, but it's probably a good idea to also follow some other signals to get some more information and correlate the, in the metabolic uh, fingerprints, let's say, with your specific signals. Yeah, because those the metabolic... Uh 
signals are overlapping spectra so it's very difficult to work with only the spectra so you need to have a lifetime understand yeah yes so the lifetime adds you the extra information to distinguish between the free and bound and yeah. also it then kind of it proves that you have the nadh in there so in our system we have coupled the two photon laser or the infrared la near infrared laser for two photon excitation with a carl size lsn uh, 880 and this one has uh, two ways of detection the signal one is the spectral detector then we get the full spectrum and one is the uh, non disk scan detector in the that follows that for, that can do the flim and basically we often switch between the detectors so the spectral detector confirms that the spe spectral fingerprint corresponds to the nadh so that we don't have any other interference and then we select the proper band pass and then we switch to flim and we acquire the lifetimes in that range so i would really recommend before do going to flim to look at the spectral pattern from this autofluorescent signals to make sure that there is no other molecule because it may happen that some cells they have some metabolites which are not so common but they can be very bright you know, so it's good to double check yeah okay thank you thank you